Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to wherever you are in the world. My name is Andrew Glazer, and today I would like to teach you how to find the x-intercepts of a cubic function. So first thing is we have to kind of know what an x-intercept is. So let's draw a little function here. Let's pretend that that approximates a cubic function. Not that it has to, but uh, it does. So the x-intercepts are going to be the locations, the coordinates you can call them, or we can just state the x-values of these points where the function crosses the x-axis. Remember the x-axis is the horizontal axis and the vertical axis is the y. Now, just from this picture alone, you actually do know something unique about each one of these three points, okay? Those three points have something in common. Do you know what it is? It turns out that the y values of each of those points is zero. Is that what you said? If you did, good job. If not, don't worry about it. But it turns out that we don't know the x value of each of the points. I have no idea what it is, but I do know the y value, right? I don't know the x, but I do know the y there. It's zero. And I don't know the x, but I do know the y. It's zero. So in other words, whenever you're finding the x-intercepts, they are the locations on the graph where the y value or the function's value is zero. Okay? In other words... When y equals, which is also the same thing as the function's value, when it equals 0, the values then of x will be the x-intercepts. Okay, now it turns out that this is very important because it's going to help us solve the problem. So, what we're going to do, plug in now 0 for f of x. So we got 0, move it over to the side a little bit. 0 is going to be equal to x cubed plus x squared, okay, minus 4x minus 4. Now, before you approach anything, right, I'd like to just have you take a step back and just think about this for a second. Can you think, now I'm not saying that it will pop out at you, all right, but can you think of any x values here that would cause this right-hand side to go to zero? Well, it doesn't seem to me, right, to kind of, it doesn't pop out at me at least, all right? I don't know exactly, right? I don't know. If this thing had an x in it, then I could say, yeah, sure, x should be zero, if x is 0, then all these terms go to 0, and that would be true. And that would be the case, all right? But we don't have an x out there. We don't have an x. And if x is 0, anyway, this whole right-hand right, uh, right -hand side would have become just negative 4. So nothing, and it's, it's like, okay, well, uh, maybe should I start guessing? No, we shouldn't start guessing. This is kind of where now the algebra comes in. And this is where practice comes in, and this is where framing comes in, all right? Now, I'm going to show you how to approach this. Now, you might say, well, how, do, how am I supposed to know how to approach it? Well, that's the whole point of learning, right? You see it done. Okay, I'll show you my method. And then you have to go out and practice, all right? Do a whole bunch of practice problems. And by the way, our channel is dedicated to that. We have literally thousands of practice problems, not only in math, but physics and chemistry as well. And we've got a lot more coming. But we, follow, we solve, not follow, we solve. We solve specific questions, all right? So you can do specific exercises, specific problems. Try it for yourself. If you get stuck, watch our video. We'll show you how to do it, okay? Now, how do I frame this problem? Now, you know, when you start this, you might say, well, maybe should I, should I you know, group this together somehow? And maybe if I can group that together, I realize that each one of those three terms has a common X. Maybe I can pull out a common X term from those so that would be become x squared. This would become now x. And then this would just become 4. And then that has to be minus 4 out there. Would this help me at all? I know I'm factoring something, but does that help? Well, not exactly. Uh, the reason being is because, let me put this in brackets. The only way that this right-hand side is going to go to 0 is if what's ever inside of these brackets becomes 4. Right? Because if that becomes 4, and then you have to subtract 4 from it, Obviously, that's going to equal zero, okay? Now, the thing is, though, do you know, if you just think about it, do you know when this should be equal to four? Not, not exactly. I mean, you might say, well, if x is two, right, then this whole thing in here has to be two. But when x is two, will this thing become two? Now, it might. It might, okay? And actually, I don't know, does it? Right, if this is two, so that's two. 
and this is 2 squared plus 2 minus 4. Oh my goodness, actually that does work, right? And 2 times 2 will be 4. So actually, guess what? We did find one, okay? We did find one. We found that x should be equal to 2 when y is equal to 0. So we actually found one. Now, that just turned out to be lucky, all right? That just turned out to be a little lucky. I wouldn't suggest you approach it that way because there can be more now values. There can be more values of x where if x, you know, another example could be x is 1, right? And then this has to become 4, right? Because 1 times 4 would equal 4, right? Positive 4, and then minus 4 would be 0. They might say, oh, will that work? And we can test it out, okay? But that's really not the best way to approach this, all right? In other words, this isn't the right way to factor it. In other words, this isn't the right way to frame the problem, okay? So let's back up. Maybe there's another way. Okay, maybe there's another way. What happens instead of me grouping these three things together, what happens if I group these two things together and then I kind of group these two things together? Can that work? And what I'm going to do here to keep this all consistent is I'm going to add a little plus sign in between. All right, because that should now keep everything consistent. If I were to distribute the plus sign to each of these terms, they would still remain negative, okay? So we need a little plus sign. And why do, while we're at it, why don't we add a little bit of color, huh? Why don't we add a little bit of color? little beautiful teal green, whatever the heck color that is. Okay, I don't know what's going on. Where's the bracket? There's the bracket. These brackets are looking pretty. Oh my God, these are pretty sad. Anyway, that's pretty sad. Oh no, no, I missed that. Okay, well, what are you going to do? What are you going to do, right? Anyway, put the plus sign in. Okay, enough of that. All right, so what happens if I frame it this way and I want to start to factor out common terms here? What do these two terms have in common? The highest common factor amongst them is going to be an x squared, right? So watch. This is now going to be, I'm going to keep the brackets, okay? And now what I'm going to do is pull out a common x squared term. And then what this reduces by now, that's just x. And this, when you divide x squared into it, it basically just becomes plus 1, okay? So if you were to distribute this, that would be x cubed, and this would be x squared, which would be exactly the same thing as what you had up there, all right? Now, let's take a look at the next bracket. So what do I realize here? Well, I realize that I actually have a common negative 4 term in each, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out a common negative 4, okay? And I'm going to open my parentheses, all right? I have to divide this by negative 4, so that becomes a x, right? And then I have to divide this by negative 4, and negative divided by negative is a positive, remember, just like this was a positive x, so that becomes plus 1. Now, this is perfect, okay? Now, this is perfect, why? And this is what you're really looking for. What you have to do is you have to frame this in some way where you're going to find common, let me highlight it, common factors, okay? A common binomial factor in each term. So generally speaking, when you have a cubic, you want to try to break it up into four parts, basically. Uh, well, two parts, excuse me. There's four pieces, but two parts, all right? And these work very well for cubics where you have three, two, one, and then zero. What happens if you have other ones? Well, we got other videos to help you out with that, all right? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have to factor out now this common x plus one term. Now, the math gets a little complicated here, all right? It's not terrible. But basically what we're going to do, and actually maybe I'll do this. I'll copy this to kind of help a little bit. Maybe this will help. So ready? Watch. What I'm going to do with this thing now is I'm going to pull out this common x plus 1 term from each. Okay? I pull that out, and I'm going to take this and pull that out. And I kind of superimpose it on one another because, right, whenever we pull out a common term, just like we did here with the x squared, it's like I was pulling an x squared out of this, and I was pulling an x squared out of that, and they both became, you know, a single x squared value there. All right, so very similar pattern to what I'm doing. Now what I would say, just get rid of these brackets because you really don't need them anymore. They're, they're useless. And then this is what's now left. Okay, it's x squared plus a negative 4. And these are all then multiplied. Okay, multiplied. And now you can kind of imagine this, right? If I were to take this x plus 1 and distribute it to the x squared, then I would have gotten this where it's x squared plus, or excuse me, multiplied by that x plus 1. If I were to take this then, right, and then distribute it to the second term, then I would have had negative 4 times x plus 1, right? So hopefully that makes sense. So what I have here is basically the same thing. That's how you factor that out, okay? Now to clean this up a little bit, because I really hate this plus minus business, just make this a minus sign, okay? It'll make our lives a lot easier. But now I have this into a form and let me just clean this up a little bit, x minus 1, okay? Because we don't need it superimposed. So x plus 1. 
So now what I have is I have something beautiful. And it's beautiful because now I can start to make logical sense of this problem. These two terms here, one, term one, and this whole term, term two, I'll call it, they're multiplied together, yes? So if I can just get this term here to become zero, then I could care less what this term is. I don't care because if this is zero, then zero times anything is going to be zero. And that's true. The whole thing will equal zero, right? We're good. And the same thing happens in with this term. If this term could only equal zero or become zero, or somehow I have to figure out what X needs to be for this thing to be zero, okay? Then this whole side goes to zero because zero times anything, I could care less what this is at the time, would be zero, right? Now you can just sit here and think about it, watch. I mean, you don't even have to do algebra at this point. What does X have to be in order for this term to become zero? Yeah, negative one, right? X is equal to negative one. And what does this term have to be, excuse me, what is this term specifically, the x, what does the x have to be in order for this term to go to zero? So, Andrew, that's simple. It's x is equal to two. I agree. But x would have also equaled negative two, right? That one you might have missed. Maybe not, right? But if x is negative two and you square it, that's a positive four. Then positive four minus the four over here is zero, okay? So really you have, you have two terms here, okay? You really have all of this stuff going on. So what we're going to now do, and actually we solved the problem already, right? I mean, these are indeed the X values, okay? These are the X values, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, okay? Now, let's write them up at the top. Actually, instead of, I don't know, I had a brain freeze for a second. I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do next. <laughs> So please forgive me. I'm going to move this on up here, okay? Let's move this on up there. Those are the values. Those are going to be your x. Those are your x uh, intercepts, okay? But how do we now finish out the algebra here? Well, we just have to write down the statements. We said that somehow I want this thing to equal zero, right? So write that down. X plus one equals zero. And somehow I want this right hand side x squared minus four equaling zero, okay? So. How do we solve it? Minus one from both sides, this is gonna be negative one. That's what we said it should be, right? How about this one? Well, you could do this in a couple of ways. You can you could factor it, you could do x, right? This is a perfect square, so it's x plus two, and then x minus two, all right? And then we can solve this whole thing, and it would be x plus two, x minus two, basically. Or we can do this a different way, and you can add the four on both sides. x squared is equal to four and then square root both sides. Now with this, when you do this, you're gonna get x is equal to two. Now technically, okay, it could have been a positive two or a negative two. Now there's some debate about out there if you take the square root, you know, if it should just be the positive answer or the negative answer. I, look, I don't really care, quite honestly. All right, all I know is that when I take a square root, I'm gonna put a plus and a minus sign there, okay? Because we saw that it should work out that way before, okay? So I really have two answers here. I have a positive two and a negative two, and that's what we said it should be, right? And if you think about now the method before that we chose that we thought might work, didn't we say that we could come up with a factor of two for X? And we did, right? I mean, it's here, okay? So notice how you can do this different ways. Some ways might get you some of the answers, but this way is probably the best way to get you all the answers, all right? Now, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, those are the roots. Now, if you're still not convinced and you're like, all right, I get the method, I kind of see this, you know, great. I, I need to see a visual. Fine, go to your calculator. Plug in the function. Do x cubed, x cubed, all right, plus x squared, plus x squared, minus 4x, minus 4x, minus 4. Now go to, I'm going to go to zoom, I'm going to go to number 6, standard, okay? And here it is now. So look, this is the graph. Okay. Now, ladies and gentlemen, each of these tick marks represents one unit. So when you count over, when you count over to the left two units, that's a negative two. Look, that's what we said. This X intercept should be negative two. That should be the X value and the Y value zero. Look, that's what we said over here, right? Count over to the one, count over one spot to the left. The coordinates of that point now right here is going to be negative one comma zero. That's what we said. 
x should be negative 1. And then count two spots to the right from the origin, and guess what? That's going to be 2 comma 0. Look at how beautiful that is. I mean, there it is, right? There it is. You can use your calculator to help you out if you want it, okay? But remember, all a graph is, it's just a series of values, right? It's just a series of, uh, let me move this down a little bit to show the function. All this is, is just plotted points. When x is equal to 1, you get a y value. You would go plot the point, right? The point here is going to be roughly right around down here. It's going to be a maximum, you know, it's going to be some number very close to, if not exactly, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, negative 6, right? And then when you plug in x is 2, the value is over here. And when x is 3, the value is all the way up there somewhere, okay, for, for the function, right? And every value in between, that's the beauty of the graph. It gives you a nice picture of what this thing really represents, okay? You can also use your table, right? Go to your table, all right? I'm going to click up a little bit here and watch. Remember, we defined the x-intercepts to be the values of x when y is equal to 0. Notice how y is equal to 0 three times here. And what's the corresponding values? Negative 2, negative 1, and positive 2. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for tuning in. I really do appreciate it. It is kind of beautiful in a way, right? When you kind of see it working from all angles, right? And seeing problems, you know, done in, from different perspectives. That's all there is to it. All right, I really do hope this video helped you out. And if it did, if you don't mind giving us a hand, like, subscribe, tell maybe some of your classmates or some of your friends, I would appreciate it. Tell both, right? Classmates and friends. Actually, if you tell them about our channel, they, you might become friends with some of your classmates. So thanks again. I really do appreciate it. And I look forward to helping you with more problems. Take care.